Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women by women on conversations that matter. I am your host, Thais Sky, international speaker, teacher, and a certified life coach currently working to become a licensed psychotherapist in the state of California. Join me here every week as I offer thoughts and interviews on what it means to reclaim your humanness in this messy world. Hello, hello, everybody. Tay Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim. This is such a good conversation. You are all in for such a treat. Uh, this recording comes from an Instagram Live that I did with my friend Mara Glatzel. Mara is pretty much the queen of needs. Her official bio is that she is an intuitive guide and energy worker for women who are yearning to belong to themselves. Um, in her work and on her podcast, Needy, Mara facilitates daily conversations about identifying, honoring, and advocating for your needs. At the core of her work is the desire to live a well-intentioned life, which means more joy, grit, and vib- vibrant imperfection to spare. Oh my gosh. I mean, even just the bio, everything about Mara is so delicious and kind and affirming. I am just, I bow to her and her work and I'm just so grateful for this conversation. Um, you can learn more about Mara at maraglatzel.com. And in this conversation, we briefly talk about her program Tend, which if you are interested, you can learn more by going to um, the link in in the show notes or by going to my website and going to the show notes there. Um, Also in this conversation, we talk about uh, my mentorship program. And so if you're just tuning into the podcast for the first time right now, I'm launching uh, a mentorship program for coaches who do depth work. So coaches who do emotional healing work, who tend to go underneath the surface. Um, Mentorship is a way that I am calling supervision in psychotherapy. Um, Basically, it's an opportunity for you to get support from me um, in your one-on-one coaching work. So how can you deepen your work in your one-on-one coaching space? Uh, And you can learn more about my mentorship by going to taissky.com forward slash mentorship. Uh, This mentorship program is great for coaches who want to be trauma-informed, somatic, and social justice-based, uh, coaches who crave professional development that is catered to their specific challenges rather than um, just another course where you're going to be taught templates and worksheets and it may not be specific to your challenge. Um, this mentorship is great for uh, coaches who used to be therapists and now want professional companionship and support in this work too. Um Mentorship is great for coaches who are experiencing burnout and want a fresh pair of eyes to their work and want to know how to move forward, want to just learn and do better in their one-on-one work. Um, whether you've been a coach for a, you know a relatively short amount of time or for a long time, this container is really going to take your work to the next level of depth and efficacy. Um, this is also great for coaches who find themselves stuck in their one-on-one work. It feels overwhelming. You feel like there's lack of boundaries. There's a lot of people pleasing going on. Um, uh, this is great for coaches who are considering grad school um, in psychology and want to dip their toes into depth work before taking that big leap and that huge investment. This is great for coaches who don't want to do it alone, right? And want to normalize getting support and feeling nourished in that support. And um, honestly, this is great for coaches who just want to be ethical and responsible about their coaching work. Um, And the cool thing about this mentorship is that I bring to it a lens of both psychotherapy uh, and coaching. Um, And so you'll get a really well-rounded perspective on your work. I know that it can feel really timid and overwhelming and and scary to bring someone into your work. I know that as coaches, we're very protective of our work and the idea of opening that up to somebody else can feel really intimidating. Like you're going to be judged and you're going to be told that you're a bad coach and that this is what you're doing is wrong. Um, But that's not the way that I hold my work. I'm here to be a a supportive role for you. I'm here to make your work even better. So there's not going to be any judgments from me. Um, in fact, I'm going to be looking at your work as from a strength space perspective of like you're doing incredible. And let's look at the ways that there could be some added perspectives that will enlighten your work. Um, so you can learn more by going to Tayskai. Um, dot com, tayskycom forward slash mentorship. Um, there's both one-on-one opportunity as well as the group mastermind. So you can learn about all that there. 
Okay, but in this conversation with Mara, the conversation is really about what it means to get support, particularly for those of us who are caregivers. This is for coaches, but it can be applicable also for all sorts of healing practitioners. Um, Mara, like I said, is the queen of needs, and I think our work marries together really well. So I'm really excited to hear about um, your thoughts on this conversation. So go find me at I am Thais Sky on Instagram and tell me all of your thoughts, okay? Um, and without further ado, let's get into this conversation. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, you know, we had a beautiful phone conversation where we were talking about um, my new offering, my mentorship, and what it means for coaches to get support. And it just felt like such a good nourishing conversation with you um, that I was really excited at the possibility of doing a live and just to continue that conversation. And, and what I'm most kind of thrilled about in this conversation is that I, I see you as like the needs expert, you know, as like the person who um, it has such a beautiful perspective and understanding and tools and ideas of how it is that we can get our needs met and what that even means. And I want to intersect that with how can us coaches do better by our clients? Because I think that those two things intersect quite beautifully in an industry that tells us coaches that we kind of have to figure it all out by ourselves. And that we as coaches in the one-on-one -on -one setting or as a space holder don't really have needs um, and, and don't really have the space to get support for what comes up in that space. So that's what I think I'm imagining the umbrella of our conversation being. And then whatever we end up talking about, we end up talking about. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> So tell, you know, for people who may not be familiar with you, like, why don't we go there? Like, start to sharing just a little bit about who you are in the world, the work that you do, all that beautiful stuff. Sure. Um, so my name is Mara Glassel, and I uh, work with people to figure out what their needs are, figure out how to get their needs met, um, how to advocate for their needs with themselves, uh, within... Their, all of their relationships, their work relationships, their interpersonal relationships. Um, and, you know, I have a special uh, love for uh, helping caregivers in particular prioritize and make space for their needs. And so that's why I'm really excited to have this conversation today. I think that, you know, a lot of times needing support or, or wanting support is seen as something that novices do or, you know, or at yeah. the beginner level, we need somebody to help us just get started in doing our work. Um, but that actually uh, investing in yourself, investing in your own space and your own learning and your own um, support system yeah. is really, I see it as that's like master level work yeah. that you yeah. care enough about your work. You care enough about, um, yourself, uh, yeah. you know, and, and you're open to receiving feedback and, mm -hmm. um, I keep thinking like normalize changing your mind. Yes. Uh, and you know, you're, 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 you are fully on board with and um, resourced enough that you're not so fragile that you think that all of your choices are good choices and all of your, you know, coaching moments are good moments because we all have moments where we're like, that didn't really land. I'm not really sure you know, that was triggering for me personally. And I was thinking about myself when I should have been thinking about them, you know, like things happen in the coaching relationship. Um, you know, whether you're doing one-on-one -on -one work or facilitating a group where it is such an act of kindness to yourself to be able to receive support and to just have a place to talk about the work that you're doing so that you can, um, yeah, have a, have a container, you know, yeah. safe space, brave space to, uh, to do your own work too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, this conversation is a perfect marriage and that I know that what you offer in your programs is a space for caregivers to go and get tended to, right. And get their own emotional cup filled because there is so much taking 
that happens as space holders. And I think that we, you know, as space holders, I'm using the word space holders because that is an umbrella term that feels more comfortable for me than just coaches because I want to talk to, ther- you know, to all people, therapists, coaches, healers, teachers, um, is that, you know, holding space is not, we're not inanimate objects. We're not a cup. We're not literally a container that can like hold everybody's stuff without it affecting us. But I think that that's how we often have been taught to look at this work is that the the best way that we can be in the room is to not have it, anything affect us, to be able to hold as much as possible. Um, but we see how that's a flawed thinking in two ways. The first is that it completely dismisses our own humanity in the relationship. And if we view any of our coaching work as a relationship, then we have to be an active participant in that relationship. Um, And two, we are, like I said, not inanimate objects. We have our limits and knowing our limits and knowing that there are places that we can go to to then empty out is so important. And so this is where I think your work and my work comes together so beautifully in that, because I know that what you tend, what you offer um, intend and your other programs is the space of like, okay, how do you nourish your needs? And I just can't overemphasize how important that is. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's amazing because we, don't meet our needs and we don't uh, make space for ourselves in our relationships, our coaching relationships or other relationships, because we think that that's what it means to do a good job. And, um, and it is exactly the opposite of doing a good job because, you know, if we're, if we're not able to bring our whole self there, um, if we're not able to actively participate, if we're not tending to our needs so that we have the capacity, I mean, not resourcing yourself to do your work. I'm not even sure if that's ethical, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, and certainly it sets you up to feel really shitty about yourself and about what you have, like what you're, what you're giving, um, because y- you know, you're fragile. And your fragility is a symptom of the fact that you have needs that aren't being taken care of. Um, Not because you're a bad coach, not because, you know, you shouldn't be doing this work, not because all of those stories that we tell ourselves. And so, you know, taking care of yourself when you're doing this kind of work isn't something that you do, you know, at the bottom of a really long list. But instead, I think it's really integral to, um, you know, to thinking about, okay, well, you know, what am I putting out there in terms of energy and how am I, um, giving, giving that energy back to myself? Mm -hmm. So, you know, both, both of those things are facets of my work. So I don't think about it like, oh, you know, I do the work and then I take care of myself. It's like, I, I have to take care of myself so that I can be actively participating in the work. And I hold space for so many people and I love doing that. Um, but it's really draining. And if I'm not taking care of myself, then I'm bringing such a fragmented and fractured version of myself to everything that I do. And, you know, they're not getting what they, what they're looking for, which is my fullness. I'm not giving what I'm looking for, which is giving my fullness. You know, it's like, it's, it, it then becomes a situation where everybody feels like they're walking away with not having received what they were looking for there. And so I think it's essential. And when it comes to considering supervision, um, you know, I really think it's about having the strength to see yourself as a human yeah, and to not expect perfection, to not hold yourself to, you know, I think we are doing harm to ourselves by holding ourselves to this impossible, unreasonable standard that we should be able to do all of this work in our houses by ourselves, locked Mm -hmm. away and somehow Mm -hmm. do it all perfectly. Even though, you know, many of us, like there's a, 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 a big difference depending on how you were trained. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then we, we take it on like it, that there's something wrong with us that we should be able to do it better than we can, yeah. or we should be able to do it alone, which I mean, is useful to no one. 
Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot of parallels between this, where what we're saying basically is like we're encouraging coaches to to do mentorship, to do supervision, um, which is what I'm offering. And then parallel that to, I think a lot of what we see on Instagram tends to be this narrative of self-healing, right? Like doing your own work by yourself, um, by the books, do the journaling, do your own meditations, um, kind of doing it by yourself. And, and I think that partly, yes, of course, no one can do the work for you. You have to do that. Um, but I think what's missing in that narrative is that it very easily hooks into cultural narrative of, of, of individualism, right? That like, you don't need anybody, that you should be able to heal all of your trauma and all of your wounding and all of your things by yourself with your journal or by thinking about it or by reading Instagram. And what was missing there is that, again, so much of our healing t- happened in relationships will then take well, so much of our trauma and our wounding has happened in relationships and therefore the healing will take place in relationship as well and entrusting and leaning into other people like yourself you know like me like other uh, he, you know healers in the world and and doing that work with somebody so i'm seeing a lot of parallels between those two conversations which is like sure yes you can do it alone yes there is a certain amount that can be done alone but you honestly don't have to keep doing it alone. And in fact, it's a cultural imperative that we shift the narrative of individualistic thinking, because it's really creating a lot of harm and perpetuating this idea that we can heal our own traumas, right? That that we don't need community care, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that we don't need each mm-hmm. other, that we got we got it by ourselves with our inner reservoir, inner resourcing. And that's not that's not the case. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think that um you know, what this is for many of us is, you know, that, that I have to go it alone. I have to do it alone. It's not safe to ask other people for help or to be vulnerable with other people, uh, stems from relational wounds. And so we may, um, really avoid, uh, trying to do this healing in relationship because it's scary. And so we think, yeah. you know, okay, well, it's easier. Um, I think back to uh, you know, like group projects in the school where you're like, well, you know, I'm the only one who's going to do the work. I'm the only one I can rely on. So I'll just do it all by myself. And something at least I, I won't like, hurt myself, right? Like at least I won't let myself down. Right. But like we're hurting ourselves all the time. And mm-hmm. part of what's great about having supervision is that you can have somebody to call you out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you're holding, when you're hurting yourself, you know, I, um, I was working with somebody the other day who is like a total powerhouse and does amazing work and was really harming themselves by, um, by holding themselves to a, such an impossible standard. I mean, and, and that's familiar to me. I'm a yes. total perfectionist. I know exactly what it feels like to hold myself to a standard that I am never going to meet. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, part of that vulnerability, but also the strength of doing this work in relationship is that there's somebody else there to say like, hey, is that kind and or reasonable and or, or helpful useful or useful? <laughs> yeah, like, what are you... <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I can I can understand what we get from holding ourselves to that standard. But, you know, I think in terms of having that compassion for ourselves and also committing to our growth, um, you know, especially around uncomfortable topics. Right. Like I know that um, a lot of coaches, uh, especially white coaches, are thinking about ways to, you know, work more into their anti-racism education and, you know, expand their understanding of how they're showing up for all of their clients. And, you know, and, and again, that shame feeling like I I'm behind, I'm doing this wrong. I need to have this conversation by myself instead of having a space to be able to process that in relationship and really, um, you know, think about yeah, and how to like embody that work, not just yes. read the articles or read the books, yes. but like really yeah. bring it in. Um, and, yeah. and, and, you know, process when, when you have done harm. Yeah. 
and yeah. and walk that back and think about how to do it better next time. Like all of these yeah. things. And, you know, we practitioners do harm in many ways all of the time. Yeah. And it can be very useful to have a safe space to talk about that. A hundred percent because ruptures in interpersonal relationships can be a tremendous space and opportunity for healing for both the practitioner, the space holder, as well as the the client. And I think because we're so adamant that we have to do perfect work and that we have to do it alone, that we miss the the delightful, gorgeousness, messiness of recognizing that harm was done and then learning from it together with your client, right? Like in that space. And I actually, um, I have my I have my comments frozen because I got we got a question from Ben Benefacto Consulting that I want to answer and I want to hear your response to Mara because I think it's a really important question in terms of relational work. Um, the question goes, you know, how do you separate yourself from getting involved into clients feeling being human and um, instead being neutral at all times and being present but not involved? So I think the question is how you know, because we mentioned the fact that we are humans and this is a relationship, the coaching work is a relationship. How much of our humanity do we bring into the relationship and how much do we not bring? And I think that that's a really great kind of coaching, um, I would say like 201 question because in the world of psychotherapy, the the kind of underlying foundational element is to not make it be about you, right? To really um, keep a strong frame where it's not about you. And in the coaching world, that tends to go the other way where the client knows a lot about the coaching. And so, you know, what does it mean to bring our humanity into the work? And, and I think we're what I'm not talking about is self-disclosure when I'm talking about my humanity. So self-disclosure is how much do I talk about myself in the room? There's a difference for me in that and what I mean when I say bringing in my humanity. But I would love to hear some of your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was getting um, my master's and, you know, the school that I went to is like pretty, um, staunchly like psychodynamic theory where you know they love the blank slate loved it which I never loved the blank slate like at all it just didn't work for me um uh but you know during that time I did one of my um practice years at a feminist therapy training site and we would talk about this a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and I think about this a lot in my coaching too because I would say even more so than when I was working as a therapist, um, I bring more of myself into my one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, but especially into my courses, um, which is to say that I do my own work out loud alongside my clients, which I think is a little bit different than um, becoming like enmeshed and to, and, you know, uh, involved over involving yourself in somebody else's process. Yeah. But I find it's really useful from a teaching and coaching perspective to, uh, I mean, get curious, like, why am I sharing this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, am I sharing it because I want them to like me? Um, because I want them to like get me or get that I get it. You know, why am I sharing this? Is it yeah. in, you know, in service to the work and also depending on the kind of environment, um, but consciously not making it about you, even if you are a, a present human being in the room. And, you know, when I, um, so for example, in one of my courses, Tend, um, we, there's like, there are prompts and, you know, we work through them all the time and, and I do them alongside everybody else. And I'm as open as I am, you know, would be anywhere about my, my own personal process. And I think that that can be a strength, but again, mm -hmm. it requires really clear boundaries. And mm -hmm. I would say that in this work, you know, it's a lot of it has to do with the same kind of boundaries that we have with anybody, right? We're not responsible for somebody else's um, process necessarily. Like we are relating and, um, being able to, and, and again, these boundaries take practice and having somebody to talk to about it is really useful because especially mm -hmm. when you're starting out, you may not know, um, some clients may feel different because they're more like you or they're not, 
or, you know, there, you may find yourself, um, surprised by trespassing against your own boundaries. Like, I think that, um, having boundaries is really essential to doing ethical and humane work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, again, it speaks to that piece of not not expecting that you yeah. you have this down and then it's never going to crop back up again, right? Like right. I think it's really useful. And again, that speaks to that piece of how you know getting supervision or getting support isn't just for beginners. For people who've been doing this for years and years and years, you get yourself into a situation or you get yourself into something that feels uncomfortable um, or, you know, where, you know, you did cross over the line. You're like, I shared that and I shared it for me um, and not in service to the work. Um, And so, you know, I think that really being in relationship with not just yourself, not just your clients, but also with your practice so yes. that you're always being thoughtful as to, you know, when do I show up? Because I think what in, in the coaching world, um, you know, in therapy, there's some overlap too, but in the coaching world, it's like, if I have a Facebook group, when am I showing up there? Like, yeah. do I have hours? I'm sh- like even boundaries like that, I think can be yeah. really useful when you have them and you communicate them and they're really clear. And um, I don't know that, I mean, I never took a coaching program, honestly. I just <laughs> got my master's in social work and did this work. But yeah. um, but I don't think that we are taught that in coaching programs. We certainly weren't taught that in uh, my school. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love this question because this, this starts to get into like the nitty gritty of coaching that like I think is so missing from the conversations. And one of the things that this brings up for me that I learned in my master's program did not learn in my coaching, like in my coaching certification before. And it has been so useful for me to know like how much, like what does it mean to bring my humanity into the room is to practice um, feeling and recognizing how I'm feeling in my body while I'm in my session with my clients. Um, because that tells me so, it's so informative um, to know what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing as my client is bringing something to me. Um, so for example, um, if a client is talking about um, her partner, I'm gonna just come up with an example here, but um, her partner cheating on her. And she's talking about it in a really like even keel voice. And I notice that I'm getting really angry and I'm like, fuck this asshole. How could he have fucking done, you know, and I'm just going and that is really informational. Like that's really helpful for me before I would have just tucked that aside. Like, it's not about me. I shouldn't be thinking these things. Like I need to be holding this clear container for my client. But now I recognize and I, I, and I understand that maybe what I'm feeling is what she can't feel because maybe she can't feel angry at her partner right now because she's living with him or, or maybe she hasn't processed enough of this to be feeling this anger and her tendency is to go towards minimizing her feelings instead of confronting her feelings and feeling them, right? That's all really important information that I now can use to determine how I want to support her. One of the ways could be to name. I wonder if you're feeling some anger here. That's really hard to recognize. So that's like one thing to do. Another way to go about it is to bring my humanity, right? And that's where I would say, I noticed that I'm feeling really angry for you. I wonder what that's like, you know? Um, And what I love about that is, again, that's the relational aspect of now she's witnessing somebody else get get angry on her behalf. That could be really supportive and useful for her. And then we can explore that and see what comes up for her. But for, for me, like my feelings has always been seen as, as difficult, too much. I'm too emotional. I feel too much. I'm too sensitive. And now I've learned that this is actually my greatest gift in my coaching work because I can use my emotions to understand what may be happening for my client. That's not, and, and I must preface this by saying that it's always circumstantial. And that's why I don't like to give kind of like how to's because I like to be in the context of things. It may not be appropriate sometimes to be bringing myself in or bringing my anger in. It could have been just me. It could be my own feelings about how my partner 10 years cheated on me. And now I'm feeling all this and it's nothing to do with her. So we really have to practice discernment 
on what we're bringing into the relationship and, and what we're feeling. Um, but that can be, all of that can be so useful. Um, and it can, and it's missing, right? This conversation is so missing in the coaching work. And that's why I'm excited about the mentorship supervision that I'm offering. And that's why I'm excited about what you get to offer in your program. So like, again, perfect marriage of our work because intent from everything that I know about you is that you're giving space for people to embody and feel and practice exploring their needs. And then in mentorship with me, that's that step of like, okay, now how do we use that in our coaching work and how can we use that in the way that's really useful for your clients so that you can support your clients get the get to the places that they want to go mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you know and i just think that uh everything is useful whether it's useful for your client or it's useful for you mm -hmm. um you know, I love thinking about it as, as data and really, um, yeah, not, not discrediting yourself. Yes. Um, because I think yes. that knowing how to build a healthily boundaried relationship with your clients is one of the best tools that you have at your disposal. And that's partially, you know, style. It's like, how do you relate to somebody? I remember in school, you know, some of my friends is like, you know, you're either naturally really good at building rapport or you have to work at it, right? So there's like the one piece of like building rapport with your clients and then, you know, having having boundaries that feel good and thinking about how you're communicating that. And I just think that there's nuance to all of that that we are selling ourselves short when we expect ourselves to be able to do all of that by ourselves. Yes. Um, you know, especially, I don't know, it's, it's really tricky. I often think about how one of the best things that I learned um, about being trained as a psychotherapist and now working as a coach is that I'm really clear on who's not appropriate for me to work with at distance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even that is not taught. You know, like, how do you assess whether or not it is a good fit for somebody to be doing this work with a coach versus a therapist that they're in the room with once a week or, you know, yep. somebody who is able to have eyes on them. Uh, and, you know, I just I think it's really it's really important um, to to receive support around yeah. how to have those conversations and how to know your own boundaries even. And, yeah. you know we're expected as therapists to have our own therapists. Well, you know, mm -hmm. there's not much of a conversation about whether or not coaches are expected to have their own coaches. And I notice in myself right. that when I have had people that I'm working with, what I'm investing in and, um, you know, making time for my, myself, my own, just like nourishment, uh, that I have a greater capacity for everything else around me. Like that's a gift yes. I'm giving to myself. It's not that we get to a point where we're, we're past that or we, you know, that, that belief, that like shame feeling of, you know, I've been doing this for X number of years, so I should know the right, right answer, be able to figure this out. You know, I see this in, I teach what I need, right? Like mm -hmm. I teach what I've done. Don't what we I all? <laughs> So, you know, when I tell my clients, I'm doing the work alongside you. I mean, obviously I've done this work for a long time um, and I have an expertise in it, but that doesn't mean that I don't still come to moments where I'm like, wow, you know, I totally abandoned myself in that room. What was going on there? Or, you know, mm -hmm. I have been avoiding this need because it's hard or scary or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. So, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, the contempt for ourselves that we should mm -hmm. be able to do this all and do it well. And that's what it means to be an expertise. And, and the tandem belief that if we don't show that level of perfection, nobody's going to pay us um, yes. because who would pay somebody who doesn't have all of the answers? Like all of these ideas need dismantling. And yes. when you're by yourself in your house, um, it's really hard to dismantle them because they feel true. They feel really true. Yeah, and it's and it's really interesting that we're telling people, right, as coaches to get support, you know, because 
you know, we see the power in our own clients work, but then we're so reluctant to get our own support. And I, yeah, I completely agree. I think it feeds right into that sense of like, if I get support, it means that I'm incompetent. It means that I'm not good enough. It feeds right into the worthiness room. It feeds right into the sense that people aren't going to pay to work with me because I'm getting supervision. I'm getting support for my coaching work. And I think that that so needs to be dismantled because we are actually doing a disservice to our clients by not getting support. Um, you know, I know my therapist is in supervision. Uh, I'm in analysis and she's, you know, whatever. So she's in her own supervision for, and I'm, I love this. I'm like, I have a whole team. Like, I don't have just my therapist. I have her therapist that's helping her help me, right? And her supervisor. So like every time I have a session with my therapist, I am actually having like a whole team of people that are wrapping their minds around how to best support me and that excites the fuck out of me like that's like yes yes because i know that if i were to bring something up that would make my 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 therapist have feelings that she has a place to go for those feelings and she's not just going to be unconsciously acting that out with me um and I'm like, this is why I want to normalize this in the coaching world, because this can be really powerful. Coaches get support from other coaches. I see that to be true, but it tends to be around business coaching, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and we're missing the emotional work um, and that emotional level and emotional layer when all we're doing is orienting our support around getting business support. Yeah. And I think that that speaks to what we are willing to invest in. Yeah. Uh, and what we think is worth spending money on and for a return know, of investment. Us, uh, yeah. We don't think that spending money on ourselves is a worthwhile investment. Yeah. Um, you know, cause it doesn't directly earn us money back. Um, and I, yeah, it's it's like incredibly backward um but i do i do see that right it's like oh i'm getting you know a new website or i'm getting this or i'm getting like a pinterest strategy or you know all of these <laughs> sorts of things like very seductive <laughs> business things um it's much a less funnel like, i'm getting a funnel <laughs> marketing a guru. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's much less seductive to be like i'm mucking around in my own shit to you know <laughs> yeah be a better everything. Um, but, you know, I think it is really essential and, and I think it's really kind and, um, you know, I, I want to normalize the idea that we can give to ourselves things that feel good instead of like things that we need strictly or, um, you know, it's like, is it bad enough to warrant getting help with this? Um, right. Is it an emergency? Uh, all of those things, instead of asking the question, like, how would it feel to be supported? Yeah. Like, if I can swing it financially, how would it feel to, like, yeah. welcome somebody else in here to support me? And, um, you know, so that I'm giving myself a space to process alongside the work that I'm doing. Yeah. And I you know, I think that's incredibly, incredibly valuable. And I, and I see, you know, I see this because I'm often participating in the self-care world. Um, and I see this in the self-care world too. Uh, the question often becomes, it's like, oh, is it going to make me like more productive or like a more patient mom or, you know, a better partner or a lover or what, like whatever, is it going to make me better somehow instead mm -hmm. of just like, I'm, going to give this to myself because it just like legitimately feels good um, yes. uh, to, to be supported, to have a space uh, that, that nothing has to be wrong or, you know, it doesn't have to be at like a certain level to deserve it or any of those things. Just like it would feel good to be yeah. supported. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, it's really important. And you know, people have all kinds of stories about that. Of course, you know, there's privilege associated with being able to afford that kind of support. Of course, um, you know, like there, there are so many things that we may uh, feel the instinct to apologize for, but 
you know, if you are able and you have the desire, uh, why not? Why stop yourself? Yeah. Why not just be generous with yourself around that? Yeah. Nothing has to be yeah. wrong. You don't have to have done anything to deserve it. Yes. I think that there is this sense that we have to feel like we deserve it before we get it. That there's a deservability factor to support. And it, it tends to be like chicken or egg situation because what I have found to be true is that whenever I do something, not out of whether or not I deserve it, but whether or not I want it and it's going to be nourishing for me and it's going to be supportive for me. When I you know, do it from that lens, the deservability tends to come with it right? The sense that I deserve um, and that I'm allowed. It, it, it just comes with when I already make the decision that I am. And that can be really hard to grapple with, particularly for those of us who have really big worthiness wounds and really feel inadequate and broken and not enough. And you know, I always make the suggestion for people to when they're buying things, when they're investing in things, don't do it out of an inadequacy because it's only going to perpetuate that inadequacy. You know, don't do it because mm-hmm. you're lacking. Um, uh, lacking internally. Um, Don't do it because you are broken and this is going to fix you. Do it because, you know, there is this a part of you that feels that this is going to offer you a greater container of nourishment and support. Do it from that place and see what changes. Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny because with Tend, my ideal client for Tend, like cannot invest in Tend. Because that's, that's like, that is their problem (laughs) is that investing in themselves is kind of a non-starter. And so it's always really funny because, um, you know, and I'm like not into any kind of like, I am not twisting anybody's arm to do anything period ever. Um, but, (laughs) but I'm always having this conversation around, you know, what it means to take up that space and what it means to be generous with yourself and to, you know, it's like, I always think about 10 as like this like secret clubhouse. That's like, it is literally just for you to be a human and to feel how you feel and to need what you need and to say what you need to say. And like, you know, your mom's not here. You're, you know, whatever. It's like, this is just a space for you. And I, I am like inherently anti, you know, this is a space for you to make yourself better in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, so it's confusing because, you know, people don't inherently want to invest in that. My people don't want to yeah. invest in that. Um, yeah. And so I well, think and I'm, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that your point is really apt, like not to invest in support for yourself from a place of, oh, like, shit, I'm really bad at this. And I probably like, you know, I need her to like whip me into shape or whatever. Um, But instead of like, wow, what would be possible for me if I had this great space to just bring myself, bring whatever it is that I've got going on and receive support so I don't feel alone? And, yeah. you know, I can process what, what's going on so that I can, I can feel better. I can feel more confident in having these conversations. I can, you know, have somebody to bounce things off of. It's such a gift. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't even know, this is the thing I'm finding about my mentorship is that people don't even really know that they're missing it. Right. Like I didn't know that I was missing this key facet that I now have and now recognize how important it is. And so it's like, how, how do we name something that we don't even know we need? And like, then offer that to the world. Um, That's where I'm finding myself at. But for, you know, when I started, so I've been coaching for 10 years. And then uh, two years ago, when I got my master's, and you know, for those eight years that I was coaching, I had my own, my own therapist, but I didn't have any support for coaching because I didn't know that that was even an option. I didn't, there was no conversations that like, oh, you should get support around your one-on-one work. All I heard was you can do an NLP training, you know, or you can do like this specific training. And even in those trainings that I took, it doesn't support you when there's someone sitting right in front of you. It's just templates, you know, it's like, workbooks and questions that you could ask but like how do you, how do you insert a question in the process it's like there's it, it was all about like content and not about the process of coaching 
like how to actually be in that space of coaching. And so I was, I've been winging it, which is great. And it's like worked out for my clients, thank God. And I'm very grateful that I'm very tender and careful with this work and that it's, it hasn't caused harm. But then I went to grad school and then everything changed because I'm like, oh my God, there is a whole industry where getting this type of support is normalized. And if you find the right supervisor and you find the right person to hold the space and you're in the space with other people and you're talking about your client, it just feels like, oh, I don't have to carry the how. How do I process mm. this? How do I support this? How do I do this all by myself? And it's like, oh my goodness, there's something so tremendously rewarding about that. And I've noticed for myself that like my burnout has decreased significantly. Mm -hmm. I've been able to hold larger, stronger container for my clients. I found for me that like, I've been able to navigate more complexity, like more complex people, because I don't need people to be exactly like me in order to work with them, you know, because that tends mm -hmm. to be also the coaching paradigm is that you only work with people that are exactly like you, because then you can put your experience on them and then expect them to get your results. So I've been able to work with people who come from more di different experiences and know how to navigate it without getting so overwhelmed. Um, yeah, it's been a game changer. And so it's exciting to offer this to the world. And it's also like, how do I single-handedly almost like support an entire wave of new thinking? And that's why I'm so grateful for you um, because I know that you are on board with this and that, you know, and Megan yesterday that like there are coaches out there who are like, no, 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 you don't have to carry this alone. Trust me, like this is necessary and we're going to be here to support you getting this message out to the world. Yeah. And I will say in mental health, not just normalized, but also legislated. So it's not ethical to be, you know, working with people um, yes. in that capacity without receiving support. And I think that that yes. piece is really essential. That is like, it's not just a good idea. It is literally the law. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I have to have 3,000 yeah. of supervised hours, 3,000. 3,000. I just want to iterate it again. How long do we think that we can do 3,000 hours? The fastest that you can do it in the state of California is three years. You cannot get your license faster than three years, which means I am invested in three years of supervised hours as a legal requirement to get my licensure. And even that doesn't eradicate the however many harmful therapists there are out there and problematic therapists, but it at least assures something in the coaching world. It's like, you can call yourself a coach and now you can market yourself in any which way and hold space in any which way and good luck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially, you know, and I know we've talked about this before, but um, for people who are doing trauma informed coaching, um, but don't necessarily have uh really like abundant training in trauma. Um, and, you know, I think it, again, it's like that knowing like what your own capacity is actually, and not disregarding that, not just thinking yeah. like, oh yeah, I can, you know, I can and should do everything. You cannot and you should not do everything. And sometimes it's hard to know what you cannot and should not do um, yeah. just, just in yourself. Um, especially when it contends with all of these other pressures to, I don't know, be able to pay your mortgage with your business or all of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's both useful and it's kind. And also it's ethical to receive mm -hmm. this sort of support to, um, to, to help you uh, know that, you know, not even that you're making the right decisions. I don't believe in right decisions, but that you're actually making decisions that are aligned with your values. Yeah. And sometimes we don't, and you know, we have to walk it back. We have to work it out. But I just think that, um, I just think it's so, it is so valuable and it's so important. And again, yeah. Uh, I think that a lot of people who are working in this field don't, don't even know that that's a yeah. thing that people right. do. Right you know, when you're getting a mental health degree of, of any kind, um, you're receiving support. And, and I remember, I mean, it is vulnerable to, to receive mm -hmm. support. Uh, I will say that I hated it. 
I super hated it because when I was, when I was receiving it and I was getting my master's in 2010 to 2012, like I was still in the thick of my perfectionism. And so I thought mm -hmm. my job was not to receive support, but to be perfect. But to show up perfectly. It's like perform yeah. perfection so that I got a, yeah. you know, an A plus rubber stamp. Um, and it wasn't until my second year of school where I really got that piece. And, and it's really, it is super hard for people yeah. who um, carry the belief that their worth is attached to their perfection to receive support. Yeah. But I will say it is all that much more important. And I know that like you just so beautifully handle working with those kinds of people. So like, if, if you're here, if you're feeling like this, this is your person, <laughs> you're so um, cute. you know, because Thank I think you. that, that the, the worthiness wound really does show up here in this feeling of like, mm -hmm. Oh, what does it mean about me? If I admit that I want or need support, um, yeah. what does it mean if I, if I, you know, receive it? It's like sometimes, um, yeah, just allowing yourself to be that vulnerable, but that's essential to the work too. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, what I have seen to be true through the women who, who I am currently working with in my mentorship is that when we can, when we can even just name that in the room together, like I'm noticing myself when, you know, talking about this client that I'm getting defensive or that I'm getting, that is even useful. Mm -hmm. right? All of this naming in relationship with another person can be so therapeutic and useful in slowly removing the narrative that there has to be this perfectionism uh, mask um, to, t to protect this tender, wounded place within us. It, all of this gets to be part of the work. That's what I love about all of this is that it, the work follows us wherever we go. And so if perfectionism is coming up for you in, in your coaching work, great, let's explore that. Let's dive into that. Let's see how that may be getting in the way of intimacy between you and your clients, right? Because that intimacy piece is the healing piece. You know, we cannot really hold space for another if we're so clouded with our own stuff and perfectionism, comparitis, these are all, you know, the, the, these are all facets of a worthiness wound that prevents us from being able to see clearly, being able to see the other. We can't see another if we're so in our own shame. Just like when we're talking about oppression, like, you know, white people cannot actually see a black person. I can't actually see them unless we're willing to see them as black humans because of the worlds that we live in and the ways in which white supremacy has um, um, colonized and indoctrinated our our way of seeing people. We can't see, like, I know the person, like, I know I cannot be seen by a man unless he recognizes my womanhood, um, because that is such a, a trivial part of my lived experience. And if they're so caught up in their shame of what it means to be a man, they can't see me. If we get caught up in our shame of being white, we can't see people of color. And if we're getting so caught up in our shame of, of what it means to be this perfect coach, then we can't actually see our clients. And that prevents us from doing the work that is being called to in the room. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think another way that that perfectionism can show up too is that the, the what you're actually experiencing is the client's hope that you know the answer that you yes. are smarter than them better than them that like you know like their hope that you are bigger than them so that yes. you know, this is safe for them and i think yes naming that too is yes. is really useful and yeah you know that piece of like you didn't like look i work with you at distance I didn't come to your house, drag you out of bed by your toe and like force you to do it. You did this. Like, yeah, you, you did this. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, that pressure um, that we can feel too is we we're receiving that from, from yeah. our clients energetically and emotionally. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's also such a great thing to explore with them, uh, but yes. also with, with support uh, to, be able to navigate that and name it and um, and use it in a way that is that serves the work. Because again, yeah. like I think that conversation goes so far uh, in terms of deepening that intimacy and really um, 
you know, just bringing so much steadiness to, yeah. to, to get handing it back. Right. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to believe that I'm able to do this in your presence because of you, but actually, you know, always handing it back and saying like, you're doing this work and yeah, that's, and you did that. And you get to take that away from this conversation, from this room, from this relationship when you move on. Yeah. Um, and that's why I love seeing my, you know, client work as a relationship because if the client is bringing to you this expectation that you are going to be able to offer the, the Holy grail, like you're going to be able to give them the, the, whatever they want to no longer feel the suffering and the pain of their lives, odds are they have lost their power, right? Because they are putting that power onto somebody else and odds are they've done it to various other people in their lives, not just you. That's wonderful. That is an incredible starting point of beginning to dismantle that within the relationship. I notice, not obviously in these words, but I notice that you're bringing all this expectation onto me. I wonder what that means for you. I wonder how you may be bringing that into other facets of your life. I wonder how, you know, you may have been taught in childhood that your power was not within you. Like, let's talk about that. Let's tend to that. Let's heal that. Let's just, you know, process that so that you can start to reclaim that power yourself and recognize that like, I am just this messy human in on this journey with you let's talk about that let's talk about what it means to see me as not perfect like what does that bring up for you that must feel confronting because so many of us see our caregivers as perfect what is it like to see that i am not perfect i mean all of this gets to be such good work and relational work and healing work and um you know as long as we're we're very mindful of our limits you know, and like really mindful and like ethical, like our scope of competence. And we're aware of what we're starting to open up and have the support around us to be able to go into those places with our clients. That's depth coaching, right? Like that's right. That's it right there. Looking at how the relationship is playing out patterns with the client in here now. This is this can be really profound work. And we miss that because we've been taught you know, to be perfect in the coaching relationship or to be imperfect, but that means not a useful imperfect, like not not being imperfect in a way that's useful and can be used in the client relationship, but to be imperfect, like abscond all responsibility and all power from the relationship, um, which also is misses the point because the coaching client relationship inherently has a power dynamic to it. So yeah, so much of the this kind of nitty gritty stuff I find missing in the greater conversation. I agree. Absolutely. So needed. So needed. Do you have any other kind of final thoughts I, you know, that you want to share as I'm totally going to own water here? <laughs> Not really. I just, you know, I think that um, really coming back to that place of what would be an act of kindness to yourself? right? How, how might giving yourself support in, you know, with your coaching, be an act of kindness to yourself and not something embarrassing or shameful or anything, but like, this is a gift I am giving to myself and also a gift I'm giving to my clients by proxy. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I love that. And I am so grateful for you. Like just, you have always been such a soft landing spot for me in our friendship and this blossoming relationship. I'm just eternally grateful for you, your work, your message, your voice, your power. Um, I'm gonna start, I'm getting a little tear. I'm trying to like stuff down my tears. I am just so grateful for you. Um, and you know, we need more humans like you in the world. So keep doing, keep doing your work. Thank you. And I'll be here celebrating you and cheering you on. Thank you for listening to Reclaim the Podcast. This podcast represents the opinions of Tai Sky and her guests to the show. The content of this podcast are for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional psychological, psychiatric, or medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified mental health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or mental disorder.